Hello, this is Gary Pinnell, and I'd like to welcome you to our Bible study this morning. We will be in Galatians chapter 2 today, so I trust that you'll join with us. We also are reading through in the Old Testament, and uh, that would be Lamentations chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 6 as well so and uh encourage you to read along with us as we read through the whole bible all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for instruction for reproof and all that we need is in christ from the word of god so let's go ahead and get started now i know some people think that uh, this book of Galatians is really, uh, it's really deep uh, and hard to understand, but I don't think so. I think there are some things we do have to uh, meditate on and think about, and, but it's like the book of Romans. It's so important for us as Christians to be into the word and understand all of the word of god and so we're just going to start here galatians chapter 2 yesterday we did an introduction and this of course is paul is pointing out that we're not saved by works we're not saved by keeping the law that means like the ten commandments and anything from the old testament like circumcision or anything like that. That's not what saves us. Uh, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is what saves us. And turning to Christ alone to save us. That is how we're saved. And he points out that even in the Old Testament, or even before the law and during the law, no one was saved by their good works or by keeping the law but it's by faith alone that people were saved in the old testament so let's go ahead and get into it and we'd like to strike start right here with then after 14 years i went up again to jerusalem with barnabas he's showing that he the message that he has of salvation was not through the other apostles, but by, was by revelation from Jesus Christ to him when he was in Saudi Arabia today, as we call it Arabia in those days, and where the uh, in the desert he was being taught by the Lord and taking Titus along with me. So after 14 years, though, he... He was up there for 15 days before, but he really didn't uh, confer with the apostles at that time, other just to visit with them the first time. But now 14 years later, and he's talking about the Acts chapter 15 here is what he's talking about. And he said, I went up because of the revelation and set before them the whole privately before those who seemed influential. Um, I was talking about James and Peter. The gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had, run, had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet, because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we had in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential uh, because in the church you know we're all equal in christ but those who are leaders that would be peter 
um, John and, and James, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. So in the church, we don't have uh, all these people are special and those other people, well, they're just uh, common people. No, that's not true in the church. Though I say who seemed influential, added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. The uncircumcised would be Gentiles. Uh, it's another term for Gentiles because usually they were not circumcised. Uh, but the circumcised, and that would be the Jewish people. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, another name for Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing that I was eager to do. Now, in Acts chapter 15, you see uh, more details here, and that's what he's referring to, the visit that he made to the church at that time in Jerusalem because they were getting a lot of opposition from people even maybe coming from the church in Jerusalem that were saying, oh, no, 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 no. The Gentiles have to be circumcised uh, in order to be a believer. And then also uh, they need to keep the Old Testament uh, rules and regulations. Well, that kind of would undo everything that Paul and the missionaries that he was sending out would undo their ministry because they're sharing that salvation is through Christ alone now that the Messiah has come, turning to him and uh, him as Savior since he died on the cross for us. They don't have to do these other things. That adds nothing uh, to their salvation. And, and it just kind of muddies the water, uh, so to speak. And so they said, they told him at that time, and in fact, you can go to Acts chapter 15. We don't have time to do that right now. But they wrote him a letter to take with them, to give to the Christians, to the other churches. This is what we stand for. There is no need for people being circumcised after they're saved. There's no need for them doing any of the Jewish uh, traditions or rules or regulations. Um, that adds nothing to their salvation. But he said, uh, you know, to help the poor. And of course, that's what Paul had always done. And uh, that was important. Of course, that didn't have anything to do with salvation either, but that is a good practice. And so <clears throat> then, but when Cephas came to Antioch, so Cephas came, Peter came up to where they had the church, a huge Gentile church, mainly Gentiles. There were some Jews there as well. I don't know exactly the percentage, but when Peter came uh, to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. Okay, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas 
was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, to Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? All right. So Peter was ah, caught in something that he was doing wrong again. Uh, this is, he was eating with the Gentiles. He came there to visit in Antioch, where there were a lot of Gentile Christians, believers there, and he was eating with them and enjoying the fellowship and so on. But then when James and um, the some other uh, brethren came from Jerusalem, uh, Jewish people, then he kind of slid away from the Gentiles and uh, he went with them and was eating with mainly the uh, the Jews, the Jewish the leaders that had come from Jerusalem, and wasn't really fellowshipping with the Gentiles then. It was pretty obvious because uh, even uh, Paul noticed it right away. And Paul, in front of everybody, must have been embarrassing uh, for Peter but uh, something that needed to be done. And Paul said, okay, you see what's happening here? You guys that came from Jerusalem, uh, Peter was eating with us and the Gentiles here. But then when you guys came, he went over and he ate only with them and wasn't fellowshipping with the other Gentiles from here in Antioch. And he said, that's not right. That's, uh, now you sent... You, you sent me a letter and you, uh, that we've been giving out to the people about uh, salvation is through Christ alone and through him alone, and you don't have to keep the law and so on. But now you're really, by your actions, you're showing something else, and that's not right. We need to stand up for the truth that we're teaching here. And even Peter and the other leaders would realize that that was the truth, that what Paul was saying, he was right and they were wrong. Uh, so then we of ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now see, he's uh, talking sarcastically uh, in such a sense that facetiously, in other words, uh, uh, see, they're, they're acting like, oh, well, Jews were better than the Gentiles. And by their actions, what they were showing. Um, and so Paul is saying, yeah, you know, we, we're, we're better than the Gentiles, yes? Yeah? And so he's saying that that to show what their, their actions are saying. Uh, but no. They're not better than the Gentiles. They're the same. Even though if you're born as a Jew or a Gentile, it doesn't matter. Okay, we are all sinners before the Lord, need Christ as our Savior. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. So their thinking uh, was, to begin with, that Jews are better than Gentiles. But that's not true. And just because God gave the law to the Jews doesn't make them any better than the Gentiles. Because through Christ, we're all one. We're all made right through the blood of Christ. But through faith, and through faith in that blood, in Christ, in Jesus Christ, so we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith, justified means just as if I'd never sinned with the righteousness of Christ added to our lives. That's what the word justified means. 
by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And that harkens back to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It uh, harkens back to Romans 6.23, for by um, Romans 6.23 says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but uh, in Romans 3.23, 6.23 says that we're saved through uh, Christ alone. And then also in Romans, it goes on to talk about that it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 as well. And then uh, that uh, those who call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus, of course, would be saved. And for by uh, grace are you saved through faith. And so he's just reiterating these things from Ephesians and Romans that he's talked about before and making it very clear that we're... Uh, and then he's going to go on to show that nobody was saved uh, by keeping the law. And um, only through faith and even in the Old Testament. Okay, so says um but if in our endeavor to be justified in christ we too were found to be sinners in christ then as servant of sin certainly not for if i rebuild what i tore down i prove myself to be a transgressor so if you save the say that you're saved through the blood of Christ and faith in him alone, but then you go back and you start keeping the law uh, to, to add something to your salvation or to think that saves you, you're wrong. For through the law, I died to the law. In other words, we're not uh, saved by the law. When we're saved, we're dead to the law. And... Um, so back up here, he makes it very clear. We're justified by faith in Christ. It's not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be saved or justified. Okay. And then he says, um, For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. And... Therefore, if we're crucified with Christ, in other words, we're dead to everything except by faith, and uh, for through faith, the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Okay. If we could be saved by keeping the law, what would be um, the purpose of Jesus dying? There would be none. Um, but... <laughs> That is not true. Christ did die. He had to die to take our place, to make us right before God. Now, even those in the Old Testament were not saved like we're saved. They were, their sin was covered by the sacrifices until the time that Jesus would die on the cross. And then they would be forgiven and their sins would be taken away that is why jesus said to the thief on the cross uh today you will be with me in paradise because he was still under during the old testament times as far as uh, christ had not died and risen from the dead 
And so those in the Old Testament were in a compartment uh, called Abraham's bosom or paradise. And it was a wonderful place to be. And the Greek word for paradise is like a river with uh, animals and trees and, and uh, a wonderful, beautiful place there alongside a river. Well, it was there that the people of the Old Testament believers were until Jesus died and because they couldn't be saved and uh, uh, in the Old Testament like we are until Jesus died and rose again. And uh, the Old Testament even says, the just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther uh, saw that and he realized that uh, his working in the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, to try to work his way to heaven was not of God. And I have to make it very clear that many people that are in the Roman Catholic Church and other churches like that, they're working, trying to work their way to heaven. Now, there are some that are truly born again because they're trusting in the blood of Christ and in salvation through Christ alone to save them. But many others are thinking that they can be saved through Mary and praying to her. There's others that think, well, if I do more good works than bad works. And then they also have what is known as purgatory that they teach about. That comes from the apocryphal books between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Uh, there are like 14 uh, books that they hold on to that are not inspired. It may be history and so on, but they're not inspired uh, as the Bible is. And that's where uh, the, one of the books of Daniel that they uh, claim that Daniel wrote, and I don't believe that it was written by him, we know that, but uh, somebody uses his name, and it, it talks about purgatory. And that would be a place where people go after they die, and they have to get their sins straightened out there before they can go to heaven. Well, that is just not correct. That is a false doctrine. And this is the way Paul was talking to the Jewish people and even some of the leaders to make sure that they knew exactly what God had told him and as an apostle equal to them that they needed to be aware of that don't add to salvation. And so he's making it very, very clear here. Now, we are crucified uh, with Christ and so our salvation is in him alone and even those of the Old Testament I said they could not be raised and uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 it talks about how he takes them out of that compartment and they're taken to uh, then to heaven because then their sins were covered after Jesus' resurrection and that's also, we talked about it before, but in uh, the other compartment in the uh, Old Testament times, so Luke talks about that, that would be uh, Hades. Uh, but in the, in the Old Testament, it's called Sheol, New Testament, Hades. But that just means the place of the departed dead. But there was another compartment, and that is the rich man was in hell and he lifted up his eyes and so on that is the temporary hell before the great white throne judgment and so there uh they're still there uh and um until the great white throne judgment now uh but we if we've received christ we have been crucified with him in other words we died with him and now we need to understand that and live that way day by day, walking in the Holy Spirit, not in the flesh, and not looking by rules that we would keep to, to justify us or to help us to be. No, we're saved by faith alone in Christ, and we live in this faith. 
and we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. <laughs> we live in the Spirit. Uh, and it's through him that lives in us. All right, our time is up there, but we want to pray. And uh, I know some people, they're probably saying, well, why do you keep praying for North Korea and, and, and communist China and, and the Muslim countries? Because many Christians are suffering greatly there, and we need to be made aware of it. And that's why we're sharing this. All right, let's pray. Father, we just come to you now in Jesus' name alone, and we thank you that for salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, and we're justified and made right with you, and we're on our way to heaven. We thank you for that. And we thank you for the many Christians around the world. They're suffering for you. And Lord, that uh, we might see them as brothers and sisters in Christ and pray for them and their suffering and lord that you will relieve their suffering and that you would cause some major changes in these countries so that they can get the gospel out and live for you the way that it's intended to be so we thank you father and we pray all these things in jesus precious name amen all right the lord bless you and we'll see you god willing tomorrow